more of you. Less of me. Through Christ I die. Amen. Father, let me go joke. Can we do rodeo? An adventurous soul entered a rodeo to see what it would be like. He signed up for the bareback event and was soon thrown off the horse, knocked cold, and rushed to the neurosurgery unit of the local hospital. How do you feel? asked a friend visiting him the next day. Not so bad, the injured rider said. At least I fulfilled a lifelong ambition of my father's. Oh, did your dad want to ride in the rodeo? No, but he always wanted me to have my head in Sam. <laughs> you know, I wonder sometimes. In the midst of Paul's wild ride, if his dad ever wondered if he should have his head examined. Well, the, the ride is going to get really wild for Paul today, and I'm so glad you're here to go along with us. I want to welcome you back to message number three in our series on Paul. Who's Paul? Paul is a man who penned, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, more of the New Testament than anyone. Paul is a man who brought the gospel of Jesus from the Middle East to Europe. Think about it. But first and foremost, he was a convert. And may I suggest, Paul was the king of the converts. Paul started out, of course, as a man named Saul, who was violently opposed to Christ and the church. But then everything changed. We learned of his conversion on the Damascus Road. We learned that if God can change Paul, do you remember? If God can change Paul, what? He can change us all. He can change us all. Then, last week, this changed man, as scary and messed up as his past was, he started to talk about Jesus. He started to tell people about Jesus. And we found him confirmed by the conversion of another person, a man named Sergius Paulus. We found his conversion and his calling confirmed by the conversion of another person. Thus we realized that if God can use Paul, what? He can use us all. Now listen, Paul has been converted, he has been confirmed, he's a Christian. So what's next? What's next? We've got the convert, we've got the confirmation. Now, 21st century American Christianity might suggest what's next for Paul is, well now he gets comfortable. Now he has Jesus in his life. So now he can get comfortable. He's going to get rich because he's going to, he's going to be so blessed. And he's going to have all kinds of stuff. Or perhaps 21st century American Christianity would say, well now Paul will become the contented. Now that he's gotten everything right with Jesus, he can just kind of sit back, become a spectator. Because he's got it all together now. He's arrived ride is over. Oh, friends, today we'll find out that the ride has just begun. And in fact, Paul is going to move forward. But moving forward is going to get him condemned. Thus we see on the big outline, the king conquered out, outline, the condemned. This is the Bible. And I'm so thrilled that we can go to it. But first, let me give you the point. And I forgot my outline on my bench, so I'll just do it from there. <laughs> the point, uh, you can see, I'll read you the first line. If you could read what's in caps, that would be super duper. 
If, Paul, if God can spare Paul, He can spare us all. All right, now, if you'd open your Bibles to Acts chapter 14. Uh, if you got home late from Belize last night on a, on a plane, you forgot your Bible, don't worry. Uh, we've got Bibles on the ends of the pews. They're you Bibles. They're there for you to use. And if you don't have a Bible, you can, you can use and understand at home. Take this one home. We love it when people take the Word of God uh, as their very own. But we also love it when we read it together. If you'd like to follow along as I read Acts chapter 14. You remember Acts is more towards the back of your Bible. There's the Gospels that start the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then Acts comes, the Acts of the Apostles. We're in Acts chapter 14. I will read you verses 1 through 7. Acts chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. Go ahead, just a couple pages. Go ahead. Actually, you keep your pages on. Okay, did you get there? Acts chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews. Others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and the Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe, and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the good news. In verses 1 through 7, we're talking about the roller coaster of ministry, really rolls. The roller coaster of ministry really rolls. Friends, <clears throat> let's define ministry. The other week in Sunday school, we're going through the purpose driven life, and uh, Rick Warren gave us this definition. I really like it. Ministry is whenever you are serving other believers. Ministry is whenever you're serving other believers. The stuff that you do with other Christians. The stuff that you do in a church. Ministry is ushering, working in the nursery, serving on the food committee, running the audio video. Okay, any number of things we do inside the church to other believers, that's ministry. Now, in this first section of the text, we see where do Paul and Barnabas go? Go ahead, look at your Bible. Where did they go? They went to the synagogue. Okay, the synagogue is where the God believers join together. The people that knew who Yahweh was, the people of the book, the people of the Bible. Now, the wild part though is, even in church, there's ups and downs, isn't there? Even in the midst of ministry, it can become a scary ride, like a roller coaster. There are ups and downs, and Paul encounters them, Paul and Barnabas do. There's always tension among people of faith. Because God is constantly challenging us. He's constantly asking us to draw closer to Him, to change and to grow. And some people embrace it, and other people don't. And unfortunately, ministry can sometimes get nasty. Church people can sometimes get nasty. These Jews, these people that were supposed to know God, they started poisoning the minds of other people. Now, wherever there's poison, there's death. And so there comes a plot to kill Paul and Barnabas. And because, of course, it was going around in church, you can't keep a secret in church. Everybody knew about it. And so the word got back to Paul and Barnabas and they took off. Even though they were condemned, God spared them, and so they moved on. Application. Have you ever experienced the roller coaster 
of ministry? That is amongst believers. Amongst believers, have you ever experienced those ups and downs and all arounds? On the up, how have you seen the gospel accepted? How have you seen miracles happen? How have you seen believers born? That's an up. And we should enjoy it. And I believe that Paul enjoyed it thoroughly in Barnabas too. But then there's the other side. How have you experienced resistance in church? How have you experienced poison and condemnation? I believe we can be spared if we choose to change and grow as God leads, leads us. You know, I doubt Paul and Barnabas ever heard that old Kenny Rogers song. But you did. You got to know when to hold them. No one to fold them. No one to walk away. See? Good theology with Ken. Not really. In church, we often need to do that. And it's that up and down, back and forth, together, that really does make ministry so exciting. But the excitement got a little too wild. And so they traded in their roller coaster for something else. Let's go see what it is. Now we're in verses 8 through 13. Verses 8 through 13. In Lystra, there sat a man crippled at his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw he had the faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw that Paul had done what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, had brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. Now they're riding the rocket of missions, and it really rocks. The rocket of missions really rocks. If ministry to believers is a roller coaster, missions, that is to unbelievers, is a rocket ride. Sky high highs and hard splashdowns. Paul and Barnabas moved out into the wilder regions. They're moving away now from the Jewish Roman civilizations. If you look at your text, it says they moved out to the country. They're moving into the countryside. But regardless, the Holy Spirit went with them. And so healing happens. Boom! They're a sensation. Why? Well, are there any Lyconian history experts in the house today? No? Good. This is the legend how I heard it. Why did these people act like this? Why did they, why did they respond like this? Well, there was an old legend in Lystra that one day, Zeus and Hermes, the local Greek gods, came down in human form. Okay? They came down to Lystra and they were disguised as beggars. They were disguised as beggars and they went door to door asking for food and shelter. And nobody in Lystra, they all slammed the door in their faces. Nobody in Lystra gave them a place to be. So when they went outside the city, they knocked on one last door, and it was an older couple, a man and a woman, and they said, yes, you may come in. We've got food for you. And so you know what Zeus and Hermes did the next morning? They killed everybody in Lystra. Okay? That was the old legend. So guess what? When the gods come to town this time, we're going to have a party. We're going to make them feel real welcome. Okay, that's, that's why, as legend holds, they did what they did. Now, at this point, I want you just to think about, if, if you were Paul and Barnabas, if you were Paul and Barnabas at this point, you had a decision to make. To who 
we partner with these people? Or do we tell them the truth? Mm. Zeus? Jesus? Hey, as long as we're having a good time, who cares? Remember, they were just condemned in the last town. They just had poison people get their church all messed up. And they were going to kill them. And now there's people celebrating that they're here. This is great. Maybe they even thought, wow, God must have spared us from that town so that we could come here and have this great party, right? It's so much fun to be loved. It's so much fun to be liked. Thanks for sparing us, God. Party on. Mm. Application. How have you been tempted to go with the flow and compromise your witness for Jesus? To not say or do something that would indicate your faith, but rather to simply go with the flow and not give credit where credit is due. Now you might say, oh, whoa, whoa, Josh. I'm not a missionary. I'm not a missionary. I don't work for a white left Bible translators. I'm not a missionary. Oh, dear friend. Do you rub shoulders with people that don't know Jesus? At work? At school? Maybe even at home? You are a missionary, my friend. You are a missionary and God has commissioned you to be a light and a witness. But then you may flip to the other channel and you might say, look, I'm not, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a pastor. I'm not ordained. I don't work for Smithville Mennonite Church. Well, are you around Christians? Are you around Christians that need you to show your witness? That need you to be Christ with skin on with them to help them? as well. Oh, friends, if you call yourself a Christian this morning, you hold that dual title of minister and missionary. Now, the question is, have you been tempted to compromise your witness at work or at school, in the community, or even at home? My question is, will you continue to or will you follow the example of Paul and Barnabas? Let's go see what they did. Finish, finish out our text, verses 14 through 20. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and they rushed out into the crowd shouting, Men, why are you, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all the nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had, difficult, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. And the next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. This is a heavy one. This is a heavy one. The reality of martyrdom is real. The reality of martyrdom is real. And this one is going to be a hard one to grab. The popularity party is over. These two Christians clarify and identify themselves and they reign on the pagan parade by explaining that there's someone else that actually gives you the reign. They stay true to mission and point to the real God, but then who shows up? Oh, the poison people from across town. They show up. Paul gets condemned and killed, or so it appears. Things get wild on the mission field. And I was so thrilled to have Sam Smucker here for a year. And many of you heard some of the stories of God's power 
and deliverance on the mission field. There are more stories out there to hear. And so we see God's mission continues. But the reality of martyrdom is really real. What's, what's martyrdom? That's one of those Christianese words. Martyrdom is simply dying for your faith. You claim God. You claim Christ. And it's a death sentence. You're condemned. It's a reality. Now, it's not fun to talk about. And our point still is, if God can spare Paul, what? But just because God can, doesn't mean he will. And we could take that in so many different ways in so many different sermons. Just because God can, doesn't mean he will. I believe God will spare us till his mission for us on earth is complete. I find it very interesting. History tells us that 10 of Jesus' original 12 disciples died martyrs' deaths. Okay? We can link the church today, Smithville Mennonite Church today, all the way back to those guys that were faithful. They stayed on mission until their mission was done. We have come through the 20th century, many of us. A century that claims to have had more people die for their faith than any other century in history, in Christian history, I should say. Around the world, persecution is happening. I strongly suggest you check out the organization Voice of the Martyrs. If you're sitting there going, man, I just don't know. You know, really? Are there that many people that are dying around the world for their faith? It's reality. It's happening. You watch the news, though you'll never hear much of it. Christians are being persecuted in, in Egypt right now. It's unbelievable. Check out Voice of the Martyrs. Voice of the Martyrs, they have a, a website, they have a newsletter that I get. It's shocking. But it's, it's the reality that martyrdom is really real. Now, Jesus was clear. Your life will be on the line if you follow him. I'm going to give you just a few verses. You don't have to go there. I'd rather have you just close your eyes and listen and imagine this is Jesus talking to you. In case you want to look it up later, in case you think I'm kidding. I'm in John chapter 15. Listen to these words. This is, this is, these are some of Jesus' last words to his disciples. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Then I jump over to 16. All of this I have told you that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this. So that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. Paul lived that, friends. Many people are living that. Paul's life is an excellent example of being spared. Okay? It, it, it's a wonderful example of being spared. If you ever feel like you're having a bad day, and you just want to give up on this whole Christian day because you're tired of getting beat up. I want you to write this down on the side of your margin there. I want you to write down uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 16 to 33. Okay, just write that down on the margin somewhere. So when you have a bad day, you can go there. I'll give you the summary. How often was Paul spared? I'll give you the summary. He was whipped five times, 39 lashes. 40 lashes minus one was a cat of nine tails. He was beaten three times with rods. I don't even know what the rods were, but they sound bad. He was stoned once, we just read about it. He was shipwrecked three times and spent a night and a day on the open sea. Yet after all those times of being spared, history tells us that Paul was probably martyred in Rome for his faith. They think Nero got him. But he stayed true to his mission and his ministry. 
He completed the ride that Jesus had him on. And we have the New Testament to, a big chunk of the New Testament to prove it. My question is, will you? Will you stay true? Now, I just gotta, I gotta give you some bonus verses. These aren't on your outline and it won't be a fill in the blank. But I gotta give you verses 21 and 22 from chapter 14. Because this is astounding. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. Here's the quote. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Will you remain true? Just because we don't see overt persecution in our country today does not mean that we never will. Are we ready to face the hardships, the persecution, armed only with the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit? Will you begin today to stand and speak against those who would seek to poison ministry, the minds of people, against the ministry of the church. When people talk badly about church leadership or church membership, will you stand against that? Will you stand up against those who would seek to pervert missions in the church? Anything that turns us from the truth, anything that turns us from Scripture and focusing on Jesus, those compromising situations that could allow you to deny your faith and go with the crowd. Will you stay true to the mission? Finally, will you speak and stand prepared to be spared from even life-threatening situations, but also with the clear understanding that when your mission and your ministry is complete, God will bring you into His heavenly kingdom and your eternal home. Will you stay true? Let's pray today that we do. Oh God, thank you for the powerful witness of Paul and Barnabas. Lord, they were men who knew you so well and trusted you so deeply that they weren't afraid to die. Even more so, Lord. They weren't afraid to live. And live they did. And left a legacy that we can continue if we have the guts to. Lord, will you help us in the midst of the roller coaster ride that is ministry? Will you help us who are engaged in missions and the rocket ride that that is? Lord, would you help us to be faithful and true? Help us to know your presence and your peace, even in the midst of struggle. Help us, Lord, to not be afraid, but to live for you each and every day. We ask this all in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people say, Amen. Amen.